So now we're going to jump into the Word. And so please turn to 1 John chapter 3. And that, if you don't have a Bible or want to use a paper one, that's going to be on page 1055 in the Bible right in front of you. Page 1055. If you're looking to follow along, that's the same version that I use here on the screens. And what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to read this passage, like we did last week, in its entirety. I'm going to pray for the Word and our hearing of it. And then we're going to work through this passage. And you'll notice as I read, um, there's a compar- com- uh, comparison that the Apostle John is making between two individuals. And it'll become very apparent very quickly. So that's what we're going to do. So here we are. Page 1055, we're in 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 10, reading all the way down to verse 18. Now, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Now, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now, we know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Well, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we in turn ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So, Father, as we now have turned to your words, the very word of God, which it is. God, I ask, Father, that you would first and foremost give us ears to hear. God, I ask that you would help our hearts to be prepared to receive what you would be speaking to us. God, help us to understand what is being presented to us, that we would look, that we would know, that we would personalize and internalize what is presented to us. God, we ask that through this passage, we would be strengthened if we are believers. God, we would be, um, what's the word, encouraged, God, and we would be emboldened to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Those perhaps who are not in the family of God and are currently not walking with you, Christ, God, I ask that today there would be a turning, there would be a warming, there would be a um, repenting to a degree, God, and seeing the great love of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you that your spirits here work way beyond anything that I can say. Help us in this endeavor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, we are starting in a similar way in which I started last week by including what I call a hinge verse. This is the verse that connects to the previous passage and then helps us introduce the current passage. And so in verse 10, John sums up his thoughts from the previous paragraph we talked about last week and then launches into his next area of focus, which is contrasting two people, be it Cain and Christ, in keeping the same theme. 
Now, if you've been with us for a while, we hopefully you remember and understand John's purpose in writing this letter, 1 John and 2 John and 3 John. He wrote these things so that we would know and understand that we have eternal life. John, verse after verse, and precept after precept, and concept after concept, builds in these contrasts, builds in tests, builds in uh, issues and items that we can look to to understand and be assured that we are indeed following Christ and we indeed have eternal life. And as he continues again into this passage, he keeps pressing in that we need to continue, if you are a child of God, doing good, and we need to continue in loving each other. And then he draws this amazing contrast between two different families. When you see it right in verse 10, and contrast is between the children of the devil, which he calls and the children of God. And he uses two representatives, two individuals to represent those families. And we just read about them. One represents the children of the devil, which is Cain, and we'll read about him in a moment. And then, of course, the other representative of the children of God is Christ, and you cannot get a more stark contrast, right? So John uses their lives and their characteristics to illustrate and describe the lives and characteristics of each member of both families. So this morning with John, we're going to contrast Cain with Christ. We're going to see them side by side so that we can, number one, understand the differences between the two. And there's a lot of differences. And then we can examine, first of all, our own lives for family resemblance and hopefully being recognized by the traits that the Apostle John puts forward for us and in those that we encounter throughout the world. So, like Charles Dickens started his famous story, The Tale of Two Cities, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times. And I'm saying this is a tale of two families, okay? That's the first point, and we're going to examine it. Now, this, is a little, this sermon's a little different than what I typically do. I typically go line by line, precept by precept, but we read the whole thing, and now I'm going to have to draw some, some comparisons, some abstractions, some, um, some characteristics of each person, okay? So we're going to look at both of these families, starting with the family of Cain. So John sets out the initial, uh, the initial parameters of each family. The children of the devil. And again, that is a strong term. This family do not do what is right, nor do they love others. Now, in contrast, the children of God do then what is right, and they love others. As he says, as we were told in the beginning, the, ma- the message of the gospel is inherent or is founded in a love of God and a love for each other. And this was a message that they have heard and hopefully you have heard. So then John, from all of the Old Testament scriptures, picks out Cain as the representative head of the family of the devil. He uses him as a concrete example of what this family is about and tells us, hey, hey, don't be like Cain. Now, we're introduced to this person named Cain all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. Now, I don't know when the last time it was that you read Genesis chapter 4 or you seriously thought about Cain. But today, we're going to because it's in our passage. And so, keep your finger in 1 John, and I'm asking you to turn over now to Genesis chapter 4. 
And we are going to read about his life. And from it, we'll see what John pulls out and we'll see what's there that will help us understand this contrast, okay? So this is Genesis chapter 4, right in the beginning. I don't have the number of that, right in the beginning of the Bible. Open it up, keep going. There it is, Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to read about Cain and we're going to talk about him. So here we go, Genesis 4, starting with verse 1. So we had the narrative of, of creation and then here we are to this family. Now, Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. Now later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain, he worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, which were fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now the Lord looked with favor, favor on Abel and his... Whoa, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> of water. <laughs> Make it clear. <laughs> uh, okay, we're reading four. And Abel also brought an offering fat portions with some of the firstborn of his flock. <laughs> now the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain... And his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain became very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, hey, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you, Cain, must rule over it. Now Cain then said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I responsible for my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Okay. Now, this is a dark passage, right? And it's right from the beginning, right? We read that it was good. We read God's beautiful creation. We read all that he assigned his crowned creation, which is man and woman. They fall, of course. They have a child. They have children. And then this and so we go, if you can go to the chart, that would be great. Bless AJ, she's going to have a busy deal. I'm going to contrast these things. Children of the de devil, the representative head is the next click, if you would please, which is Cain, okay? And the first characteristic we see about Cain is this. Go ahead if you hit it, that'd be great. Thanks. He displeased, or the children of the devil displease God. Now, if you go back into this passage, you see that Cain and Abel both were employed. You see them working hard. You see both of them having an awareness of God. And they knew, and it's safe to assume, in talking to their parents, they knew about God. They knew what had happened. They knew what God had done and said and who he was. And they are both looking to worship him. They are both looking to please and as we read, one brought from the flock of firstborn. And now Cain, since he was a farmer, brought some crops of his field. So why was it that God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Don't touch your mouth, Dave. <laughs> but but that's a serious question, like, what in the world? Weren't they both trying to please God? Weren't they both trying to have a relationship with God? Why did God receive Abel's offering, and why did God reject Cain's? Well, let me tell you. Okay. 
Do you remember when Adam and Eve first disobeyed? Remember, it talks about, Scripture talks about they were naked and unashamed. Okay? What that means, they were innocent, they were open, they were completely vulnerable in the best way. Once they knew that they had sin, they certainly became aware of their own sin and they wanted to hide themselves, so they covered themselves with leaves. Now God approached them and this haunting question was asked, Adam, where are you? Now God wasn't asking that question because Adam was really good at camouflage and he didn't know where he was, right? Of course God knew where he was. When God asks us the question, he's not looking for our answer. He's looking that we would become aware of our answer. So he asks them, where are you? And they hid themselves with leaves. And after they had a conversation, God then replaced their own Uh, merits their own efforts to cover themselves with a different covering. You know what he did? He killed an animal, right? And covered them in skins. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because that, by the way, pointed to Christ, right? The one who would give His life so that we can be covered. Our sin would be forgiven. So the efforts of Adam and Eve and now the efforts of this young man, Cain, was his effort to be acceptable to God, to cover over himself or to give him something, right? And Why was the produce of the field, whatever it is, let's just say it was corn and tomatoes, why was that unacceptable? Because nothing had to die to give that. The plant could produce corn and can produce uh, tomatoes or berries and then continue to do these things. It was just giving some of his good work, some of his good efforts, and say, God, this should be good enough. I'm giving this to you, whereas Abel sacrificed, get this, the firstborn. Just like Christ was the beloved son or the firstborn over all creation. There had to be a death because the wages of sin is death. And these boys certainly knew this. As this was communicated in Genesis chapter 3, the importance of this. And these boys knew this, but yet Abel understood and said, the only covering that will cover me, that will make, will atone for my sins, is the death of something. So therefore he gave his first, he gave his best, and that thing can no longer produce. Right, Pointing to Christ. Whereas Abel, out of trying to do his good works and trying to give his best effort, just kind of gave some of these things and thought it would make him acceptable to God. There is deep theological truth in this. And so Cain was not accepted because he didn't please God, but God gave him a way in which he could do it, right? He wasn't saying, oh, sorry, Cain, I'm done with you. He says, hey, 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 Cain, if you do what was right, and this wasn't his effort, like, hey, bring more grain and bring more tomatoes and bring more cucumbers and bring more. It wasn't that. It, wasn't that. it says, if you do what is right, which means you understand that you are far from me, that you are a trespasser, and you understand that it takes the death of somebody in your place to cover your own shame, your own sin, to make us to be right again. If you understand that and do that, Cain, it will be good with you. You'll be, well, be right. But Cain, I want to let you know that sin desires you, right? Do you, you like this personification of sin? Like he's waiting in a dark hallway or behind a tree, waiting to take you out, Cain. But you, Cain, have a responsibility. You, Cain. You must conquer it. So Cain displeased 
God. And it represents, this is children of the world or children of the devil. And these folks are, are, are not like they don't believe that there is a God. They believe there is a God, right? Most people believe that there is a God. But most people want to be accepted by God by their good works and their efforts. Do you understand that? His anger towards God and others showed itself in how he related to others in this world. This is a characteristic of those who are of the world or of the devil. Now this internal motivation turned into, again, evil actions. And this is the next fill-in. This anger expressed itself through these things. And again, the goal of these actions was to destroy and dismantle and disfigure God and those who pleased him. Now, by the way, when Jesus taught, he equated anger with murder. Do you know this? It's in Matthew chapter 5. Because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, you heard it said, but I tell you. And one of these, you heard it said in the law, you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with your brother and sister, it is as you are a murderer. Anger being the root cause of the final fruit of that. You say, well, I've never murdered anybody, but have you been angry with somebody? The answer is yes, okay? No, I never have. Yes, you have. I have, right? Anger enough to destroy them, want to dismantle them, want to take them out. And I'm not necessarily saying physically. Right? I'm talking that you just want them to suffer or to hurt or to whatever that is. It's not the way of the cross, but it is the way of the devil. So these evil actions took place. And then from these evil actions, there is a taking of life from others. Now in this case, in Cain's case, it was physically done this way. But if you're angry, you want to destroy other people. And if you're walking, not as a child of God, but a child of the world or the child of the devil, your orientation to the world is you want to take as much as you can to get as much as you can. And you don't necessarily care about other people or you only care about them to the extent of how their lives affect your life. Do you understand this? Right. You say, yes, can, can, can people love people? Surely. But often the question is, what's the motive is it? Is you loving people because you truly love them and want to give your life for them and want to give to them? Bless you, times three. <laughs> Welcome to allergy season, right? <laughs> is that our motive or is our motive always, what can I get from it? What can I get out of it? If I do this for you, then what will you do for me? Do you understand this, right? There is a hurting of, there is a taking life from others, and these are characteristics of this family. Next, there is a walk or walking in darkness. So, children of the devil walk in darkness. Now, remember that Cain did this thing and he went to go hide it up. And then, when God asked them, Hey, 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 Cain, where's your brother? <laughs> Again, he wasn't asking because he didn't know. Hey, Cain, what happened? What are you talking about? I have a brother? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Abel? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not in charge of him. I'm not my brother's keeper. This is what happens. There is a lying. There is a covering up. And one of the names of the devil, by the way, is the father of what? Oh, you've read that one. Lies. Deception. Twisting. Turning, perverting, making something look a lot different than it actually is. The devil, by the way, is a very good salesman, right? Buy now and you will pay later. But we're not going to talk about that, right? And so this is what happens. There's a covering up of motives. There's a covering up of actions. There's a covering up because there's anger here, and it's not walking in the light, which is taking responsibility of your sin, but it is trying to cover it up. And then 
this man Cain was overcome by sin, right? Desiring to have him, and he gave into it. And sin, by the way, is never satisfied. It always wants more. Never satisfied. Taking a little bit seems pretty good, and then it's boring. You want a little bit more. And you do that, and then you want a little bit more. And then you want a little bit more. And just fill in the blank or pick your poison. It always wants more. Because it wants all of you. And anger turned into bitterness, turned into hatred, turned into preempted or premeditated, turned into murder. It grows and it overcame him. Those of this family are overcome by sin. And they are, as John puts, rejected by God. Why? Because they rejected God's provision and covering of their sin by the death of the sinless one, Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? That's why, right? Rejected by God because they reject the answer to our sin problem, which was Jesus Christ, the sinless one, giving his life on our behalf. And so therefore we are still in death, therefore we are still in sin, and we receive eternal death, which is the next fill-in. Those are the children of God. They are now loving towards God and others. This is the, what, the greatest command. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. We love because he first loved us. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love other people because God loved us. He puts his love in our heart so that we can express it to each other and to God. You and I, naturally, we don't love very well be real honest. We need God's love to do it. You cannot do it without his love in your heart. Even to loving your enemies as yourself. Only God does that and puts that type of love in our heart. So this family, they please God, they're loving towards God and others, and Christ, of course, did that. He gave himself And he showed love to each person. Loving one another is both, by the way, a duty and, according to this, a test. It is a duty that we are commanded as Christians to practice love. It's a test that in our practice of love for others, this demonstrates the reality of our Christian faith. Now, there is a loving towards others. Instead of unrighteous actions or evil actions, now there should be righteous actions. Actions, which is doing right as an outworking of loving other people. This is the good works that we were created to do. Again, we do these things not to earn salvation. We do them as an expression that we are saved. You and I have purposes in doing so. And says, hey, God's family has righteous actions. And we are to love each other in Actions and in truth. If you have a brother who has needs and you have some able to help, guess what? Help them. Well, that really stinks for you. Have a nice life, okay? Doesn't cut it. What can we do to express love towards each other in practical ways? Which would include things like picking people up or making them a meal or fixing their stuff or giving them more spoons for their spoon collection. Anything like that. (laughs) Just kidding. I have a spoon collection. Like, yeah, okay, who cares? All right. Here's how we do that, right? Now, also we're supposed to love each other in action. And the second, what's the second one? Truth, right? One of the most loving things you can do to someone is tell them the truth. It is hard to. Thank you, Thomas. I hear you. It is hard. Telling them the truth, but owning the truth. You hear that? Owning what is true about yourself, about God, and also explaining this to others. We can love each other by telling each other the truth. This helps us. So we do this, right? Just actions. We give our lives 
for others, right? This is in stark con- contrast from taking lives for others. Those who are part of the children of God, if you can go to the next one, please. Those who are part of the children of God give life for others. Christ gave his life for others. We are to give our lives for other people. Right? Your life is for you, but it's not about you. Right? Your salvation is for you, but it's not about you. It's about God and Christ. It's about what he's doing in the world. And so those who are walking in the family of God are orientated towards giving their life for others. Now we know Christ did this as once and for all. But guess what? More than likely you're not going to die for someone else. That's the truth. Okay, Not in one thing. You might, but probably not. But we're called to take up our cross daily. You know what that means? Die daily, right? That means the simple actions of giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, of denying yourself when your spouse, I know your spouse is never crabby, like I'm never crabby. I am sometimes, right? Of extending grace and life to them, right? And giving to each other. This is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment giving of your life for the benefit of others, Love is the denial of self for the other's gain. Love does not destroy another person's life. We are called to lay down our lives for our friends, John 15, 13. Now, in contrast to walking in darkness, those who are children of God walk in, of course, light. We're told to walk in light, which means that we're walking in truth, we're being transparent, we're being transparent with God according to what is true about us. We're confessing and owning our sins, getting it right, and we're going closer to him. Instead of hiding and distancing ourselves and and trying to make things look different than they are, those who are the children of God walk in light. Next up, instead of being overcome by sin, those are the children of God, overcome sin. Remember John saying, hey, if you're walking as Christ, you are continually fighting against it, not giving into it and embracing it, becoming best friends with sin. This is what John is telling us. Of course, Christ overcame all sin, and we as children of God will continue to walk and fight against it. Those who do these things, of course, are accepted by God. Those who are in Christ and serve him, following after him, are accepted by him. I have lots of scriptures in your notes again. Because they are in Christ and they live to follow him. This group of people receive not eternal death, eternal life. And life evermore. And we are born into the first family, but we're born again into the second family. This is why Christ says you must be born again. You can't be acceptable to God because we're trespassers. So God has to cover our sin, and he did it through Jesus Christ, and all can be accepted by God and receive eternal life in him. And then he gives us a new nature. We are born once physically. We're born again spiritually into God's family. These are important things for us, and we will celebrate this new birth through baptism, through discipleship, through continuing to move forward. So I want us to understand, and we're going to turn to communion, and unquote, good Christian. That's not true either, right? Sometimes you're just a jerk. Stop it, right? But if you are living as Christ, looking to do what's good, (laughs) continue to do their thing. But it says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Galatians 5 says, the only thing that counts, by the way, is faith expressing itself through love. God, help us to spur one another to love and good deeds. Because love is the indisputable mark of genuine Christianity. God, help us to do this. Look for ways to love. Look for ways to express God's goodness in you and through you and demonstrate these things to others in action and in truth. 